Hi, Adam. Hi, how are you? I'm doing fine. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright. This is the Wright Show available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You're Adam Weinstein. You are a research fellow at the Quincy Institute. You specialize in Afghanistan. Um, and in fact, you've been a prominent voice in the whole conversation about Afghanistan. Uh, you've been an, an advocate of, of withdrawal. Um, and you've also served uh, in Afghanistan as, as a Marine. And so you have a kind of a vantage point that a lot of people don't have. Um, and uh, obviously, we're going to talk about Afghanistan. It's very much in the news. Uh, it seems like uh, more or less every day you hear about another uh, provincial capital having fallen to the Taliban, of, of course, with the, uh, you know, with the withdrawal of American troops. Um being, I guess, official next month, but but being more or less complete as of now. Um, I'd like to, you know, I want to eventually get into uh, various aspects of this, you know, what you think is going to happen next, how this could play out, uh, how much human suffering might be entailed in the various ways it could it could play out, and particularly... How how you think this may look from the point of view of of various uh, groups in Afghanistan, um, ranging from the government to uh, to to people in cities to to uh, people in more rural areas. Um, but I'd like to start by just asking you to talk a little about your time in Afghanistan as Marine. Uh, I think you were there in 2012. Um, and although that seems like a long time ago, nine, nine years, it was actually, uh, a longer time than that after the, uh, the, the invasion, right? So that, that was a little past the midway point. Uh, that was 11 years after the invasion. Um, can you talk about what, what you were doing there? Uh, what, what kind of your job was? And, and then talk a little about what you, what you learned there. What, what some of your first takeaways? were yeah well it does put things into stark relief about just how long we've been there because my deployment in 2012 you know in my lifetime feels like feels like a long time ago it feels like a lifetime ago in fact and yet uh we're still there and as you point out that was really just halfway into the war when i deployed in 2012 it was at the tail end of the surge that had been ordered by uh president obama which began in 2009 and it was really at its height between 2009 and 2011. And we were beginning to wind down in 2012, but there were still a significant number of troops there. Um, and I, I deployed as a U.S. Marine, but I was part of a small detachment that was sent to support um, the, uh, uh, sorry, the Australian uh, two commando regiment, which is uh, the Australian special forces and, uh, they, they also have the SAS, but in, in this case, I was only supporting the two commando regiment. Um, and that was in Terencot, uh, in, in, uh, Aruzgan province. Um, and that's in the southwest of the, the country. Um, my job was a radio operator. I was enlisted. I wasn't an officer, but I was a radio operator who supported, uh, a JTAC, which is someone who calls in close air support, um, and artillery. So basically the job was to help coordinate close air support, um, and, uh, and, and artillery for, uh, the Australians. And we were, you know, talking to the majority of the aircraft were American and we were talking to the aircraft for the Australians as they would move through villages and, and mountains. And, uh, close air support was a big part of the U S war in Afghanistan. It was one of the only things that the Taliban were really afraid of. Um, but it did have to work in tandem with infantry maneuvers and ground maneuvers. It, it was, you know, that's why when people say, well, let's just continue airstrikes. Well, it's not, a, it, it can only be as effective as your partner force is effective. And I guess my main takeaway from my time in Afghanistan, uh, is that it just wasn't clear what we were doing there. When I was pretty gung ho when I, deployed. I volunteered for the Marine Corps. I volunteered for the deployment. You know, you might even argue that I competed for the deployment because there weren't that many deployments for my unit at that time. And so you, they basically would call for volunteers. And then you had to go through all this 
pre-deployment training. And depending on your performance, you got to, to deploy or didn't deploy. And, you know, at the time I was, I was like 22 years old. I was worried I was going to miss the war, so to speak. I believed it was, it, it was a really just, uh, and good use of my time. Um, and I wanted the adventure of it. Uh, and you know, I, but when I got to Afghanistan, a lot of the time, it just felt like, you know, we're expending incredible resources and manpower and air power to temporarily secure a remote village in Kandahar, Helmand province or someplace in Aruzgan. And it just didn't, it didn't make common sense to me at that time. I didn't have a very nuanced understanding of policy. I was junior enlisted, so I didn't have a nuanced understanding of military tactics, but it just, it didn't make common sense to me. Mm -hmm. Um, and did you get, uh, a, a new sense for how the war was viewed by people in Afghanistan. I mean, you didn't have a lot of uh, interaction, I gather, with uh, people directly, uh, Afghans directly affected by the war. Well, I mean, I had some contact with Afghans if we went on patrols, but of course it wasn't a, you know, it, it was almost like the police versus the police in that scenario. So that the interactions were not natural per se. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a language barrier. Um, I, look, I got the sense that the communities were just stuck between the ANDSF, the U S uh, and, and ISAF forces um, and uh, the Taliban at that time. They, so ANDSF is a Afghan yeah. national. Yeah, they're just the Afghan security forces, okay. so the army, the provincial police, et cetera. Um, and, I, you know, they were just these were rural communities that were eking out a living in the midst of this war that was going on. Um, and it was a little bit unclear to me what what they thought or didn't think at that mm -hmm. time. I didn't really have a good sense of it. Yeah. Um, have you uh, I mean, you've been kind of studying the situation intermittently ever since um do you have a sense for how much support the taliban have in uh you know i would assume there's more of it in rural areas than in urban areas but uh is there any way of gauging that i mean this is a tough question especially in a country where there's um you know, a lack of access to many parts of the country and where the identity of the person asking the questions can affect the answers, which is always true in, in polling and, and uh, interview research. A lot of people have, a lot of academics and researchers have dedicated a significant amount of time to this question. From my anecdotal experiences, from reading the research, from talking to a lot of experts, I think it's safe to say that the majority of Afghans prefer the Republic of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan over the Taliban. So they prefer that what's sometimes called uh, the post bond political order, you know, this elections and the Afghan government in Kabul over the Taliban. But that doesn't mean that they support a particular administration. They may be very critical of the Ghani administration. They may think the government is corrupt um, and be very disappointed in it, but they still prefer it over the Taliban. The support for the government is much higher in Kabul and provincial capitals. And, mm -hmm. you know, the highest being in Kabul and probably, you know, also high in provincial capitals, but not quite as high. Um, it's still there in the rural areas. But where I think the difference is, is that the gap between where people would rank the Taliban and the government becomes a bit smaller. And so then you have this question you know, of why do we see the ANDSF not not necessarily fighting um, the Taliban very hard, at least the regular ANDSF, or, you know, the Taliban being able to take a provincial capital without a shot being fired? Well, that's because I think there's a demographic of the population that might prefer the republic, but they're not willing to die for it. And I think for much of the civilian population, particularly in the rural areas, their first preference is peace. And they want they want to see an end to the war. Um, and and I think, you know, they may the scales tipped in favor of the Republic, but the Taliban is able to make inroads if it's seen as being able to uh, 
provide justice or provide more functional services or um, or bring an end to hostilities uh, by forcing the ANDSF either to surrender or flee. So I think that's where things get a little bit messy and where there's a misunderstanding. It's not it's not that people support the Taliban. It's that the Afghan government has forfeited uh, many opportunities to, I hate to use this phrase, win the hearts and minds of the of the Afghan people. Yeah, so the government has a reputation for, I guess, kind of corruption and, and inefficiency, I gather. So your sense is that people like the idea of a government like this uh, more than they like this particular incarnation of it. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to summarize what I said. Um, so uh, I, I guess, you know, if, if you mentioned that that sometimes, you know, uh, power is changing hands without a lot of shots being fired. Uh, so in some cases, uh, that means that, that military commanders in, in the Afghan uh, armed forces are basically just choosing to surrender rather than fight, right? Yeah, that's true. And some of that has to do with morale. Some of that has to do with resolve to fight. And some of it has to do with uh, supplies and, and um, problem, you know, lack of ammunition or the sense that uh, they won't be resupplied uh, if they do fight. So I think there's a prisoner's dilemma at play, which is, well, if we really go out and fight, is the government in Kabul going to have our back at the end of the day? And if not, maybe we should just surrender. Mm-hmm. Um, because I mean, if, uh, you know, if victory, if complete victory by the Taliban is inevitable, I guess this is the way you'd like it to happen. Right. I, I mean, fewer people die. Well, I mean, if we were to really step back and and look at uh, civil wars, and I would define Afghanistan as a civil war with very, very powerful third party interveners. So it has elements of a proxy war in that the Pak in Pakistan, in that Pakistan has supported the Taliban and the U.S. has supported the Afghan government and other countries have meddled as well, including Iran, Russia, China. So it's a civil war with elements of a proxy war, but I'd still, you know, say it's, it's, it's best classified as a civil war. Um, if you look at net violence or net death, when one side in a, a civil war rapidly defeats the other militarily, sometimes the net effect is that there's less violence and let, less death and less of a chance of, of the war reigniting. Um, the political science literature reveals that. That being said, it's hard to go, you know, I don't think you can go to an Afghan woman or, or, or Afghans in general and say, hey, don't worry about these Taliban gains and advances because in 20 years, maybe there will be more stability than if, you, you know, if it, the ANDSF is able to, you know, achieve a stalemate. That doesn't really give people much um, much comfort. So, you know, it depends how we define quality of life. I mean, a rapid Taliban advancement might reduce the number of people who are killed, but it might not because they're also engaging in war crimes and reprisals and summary executions. So it's really too messy to say. I mean, the only ideal scenario, you know, ideal scenario for Afghanistan would be a political settlement that brings peace to the country. But in order for that to happen, the ANDSF are going to have to fight through summer and fall and really demonstrate to the Taliban that they can't just be steamrolled. So, you know, this is an uncomfortable reality that there's going to have to be more violence for a political settlement to even be possible for the leverage to exist for it to be possible. Um, and, 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 uh, the alternative is that the Taliban takes over the country or potentially that there's just in, an ever intensifying civil war. So um, all three outcomes look bad right now. Yeah. Um, so on, on this, you know, on this issue of the prospect of the Taliban running everybody's lives, um, do you have a sense for, how many Afghans are horrified by that? In other words, um, I assume that, uh, especially in the rural areas, uh, 
there are a lot of kind of conservatively religious people who are on board with maybe some aspects of the Taliban's value system. Uh, but I don't have a sense for whether there are many at all who, who, who would buy in, who would voluntarily buy into the full on Taliban agenda. You know, the, the, uh, the degree of constraint on the freedom of women and so on that, that, that entails. Is there any way of having a sense for that? Well, polling suggests that even in rural, deeply conservative rural areas, people still want their daughters to be educated. I mean, they might want, you know, schools that are separated by gender and they might want the teachers to be, to be, uh, to be women if it's girls who are being educated and things like this, but they still want their daughters to be educated by and large and they want freedom of movement and they might like the swiftness of Taliban justice, but they, they likely reject the harshness of it. Um, so I don't think there's many Afghans who buy into the Taliban emirate style of, of governance. But this takes us back to, well, do they truly believe in the Afghan government enough to fight for it? And that's mm-hmm. the problem we get into. Yeah. And is it possible to, I, I mean, is, is it still, it is still official Taliban policy. Girls just don't get educated. They've released a, a lot of mixed signals about that. The reports we hear, we, we hear about where the Taliban do govern and have control, um, show that, you know, in, in some cases they don't let girls become educated, but in other cases at a young age, they do. That sort of falls outside of my area of expertise, to be honest. There are people who have exclusively focused on education in Afghanistan who would be better suited to answer the question. But I think right now it's a little bit unclear where they stand, but they seem to be erring on the side of, you know, putting women back in the house and not allowing them to have um, a, a public life, which which I think is deeply concerning. Mm-hmm. Now, I've been hearing a little about um, the Taliban at least putting on a show of relative moderation, at least compared to the last time they ruled the whole country. And that may be something they're doing more in urban areas as they start to take control of those I don't know, but do do you have a view on like uh, the extent to which uh, this is just show to the extent that it's even happening? And we can assume that we'll see Taliban 1.0 if they if they wind up controlling the whole country. Uh, Or is there reason to think that maybe they would have a more um, flexible approach this time? For example, possibly a different set of policies in urban areas from most rural areas. There have been varied policies depending on the Taliban commander in charge and depending on the area. And you, the Taliban are not a total monolith. There's, there's people who are more hardliners than others. That being said, the reports I've heard from places like Spain Bulldog, Spain Bulldog from places in, in Kandahar and Helmand that have been under Taliban control for years or, um, and, and from some of the cities they've captured is that they've been quite brutal and they don't seem to have changed. Uh, it, it doesn't make rational sense for them to, 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 you know, take a totally hard line approach because in a lot of ways, if, if they were just to moderate on a few basic things, they could probably have much more uh, success politically and perhaps a tougher fight ahead. Um, but they are at the end of the day, an ideological group. I mean, they may be a rational actor to some extent, but they still are a extremely ideological organization. So I don't see them. I don't see them changing. Now, I don't think the fact that the Taliban haven't changed uh, should alter President Biden's decision. But I also, you know, have always advocated that it's important to be honest about who the Taliban are um, and, you know, not to to whitewash the group to make the withdrawal decision more palatable. The withdrawal decision makes sense in its own right, and it doesn't require a revisionist account of the Taliban. They've, you know, their statements sometimes appear moderate, um, and I think they've gotten better at stratcoms and PR, um, and they sort of 
co-opted the language of human rights at times, but they don't seem to know how to use it or understand what it means. They just mm-hmm. uh, put out these statements that sound good, but are, are relatively meaningless and are very detached from what's happening on the ground. Okay. So before we move on to what you see happening uh, in the in the future and what the various scenarios are, why don't we drill down on this point a little? And why don't you tell us why, notwithstanding how bad you think uh, life may be for some people under the Taliban, uh, including some people who would not be under Taliban control if we didn't withdraw, you think withdrawal still makes sense? Well, it's simple. The U.S. military couldn't provide a solution to this war. And Taliban gains were slowly accruing over the last several years, even with U.S. troops and U.S. air power. Um, the presence of U.S. troops was keeping violence at a simmer rather than the surge in violence we're seeing. But it also wasn't offering a long term solution. And one could argue it was even standing in the way of a long term equilibrium developing. Um, and I think the only honest case that could be made for keeping U.S. troops is that U.S. troops should be kept there indefinitely, um, measured in decades, not years. Anyone who argued, you know, that that U.S. troops could be kept another year or two years uh, wasn't really being intellectually honest about what was possible. And in fact, look at what's happening now that U.S. troops have left. And look at the performance of the ANDSF or the Afghan security forces. Can anyone with a straight face argue that one more year would have made a difference uh, in these circumstances? I don't think so. And another uh, you know, argument that was put forward disingenuously, in my opinion, is this idea, well, the United States was took no combat deaths in over a year. Well, that's because there was an agreement with the Taliban. And if the U.S. abrogated that agreement, which they already have by definition, and so have the Taliban, but if they were, if the Biden administration were to completely abrogate that agreement and just stay on indefinitely, these insider attacks, this surge in violence would have also been directed at U.S. troops. Well, people might accept that. But most proponents of the, of the forever war don't accept that. But even the ones who do will then come back and say, yeah, but if you look at the years prior, you know, we're looking at a dozen deaths or 20 deaths. I think it is disturbing to see the callousness with which U.S. troops are discussed. And then, you know, the the answer to that might be, well, do you think U.S. lives are more valuable than Afghan lives? Or is losing 20 U.S. soldiers worth it to, to stop, you know, to prevent the violence we're seeing today? Well, in a society that has an all-volunteer military force, in a country that's deeply unequal, like the United States, I don't think we should be talking about U.S. troops like that. But at the end of the day, what it really comes down to is that U.S. troops couldn't provide a solution. The mission didn't make sense and it wasn't achievable. You know, I was a Marine. People who enlist in the Marine Corps and and the U.S. military in general know the risks that come with it. Inside, you know, you could say Marines are supposed to die for their country. It's not a tragedy when when a Marine dies in the service of the United States, that's, that's our job. But it is a tragedy if that death occurs in furtherance of a policy that has no end goal and no mm-hmm. achievable end state. And so that's why I supported the withdrawal. And unfortunately in Washington, people have become so comfortable with just using feel good language. That's absolutely empty. We need to stand by the Afghan people. Okay. What does that mean? We can't allow this to happen. What does that mean? Um, that people have, have detached themselves from any responsibility for the policies they advocate for. Yeah. I mean, there's also the fact, I gather, that even just looking at it from the point of view of the Afghan people, um, as long as we were there, there was a low-grade civil war going on. In other words, even if the Taliban agree not to attack U.S. troops for a while, there's still violence happening. And, and I assume, uh, that the, I have no sense actually of the, of the toll taken among Afghans, uh, but it was there on a day to day basis, right? Yeah. I mean, in some ways, the media and, you know, certain talking heads in Washington have now discovered the war in Afghanistan and many of them have been detached from it for years. Of course, there's many journalists and human rights advocates and 
even folks who disagree with the withdrawal who have been very focused on the war for many years and I think uh, come from a place of good intentions, even if I disagree with some of their conclusions. But for a lot of people um, so, who are wringing their fists at this withdrawal, they didn't care about the human misery that was occurring for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, so has have you been surprised by the speed of the Taliban advances? I've been perhaps naively surprised at the fact that the regular ANDSF in many cases have not put up a fight. And what the Afghan government has had to do is to fly the commandos all around the country and you, and basically rely on, on their special forces. The, yeah. Their, their elite forces are their seem to be forces. the ones that can be relied on to fight. Yeah. And you can't win, you can't win a war that way. I mean, they're yeah. using the, they're, 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 overusing the elite forces um, and over relying on their own air power and their own and their air force. I mean, I've heard something like half of their aircraft are, are down for maintenance. I mean, it's not sustainable. So I've been a little bit surprised at just how, you know, I, I expected the Taliban to put up a, 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 a form to be a formidable opponent to the regular NDSF, but I thought there would be some fighting in many cases, there's been no fighting. Now, there are exceptions. There are places where the fighting has been significant, like you look at Herat, for example. But, you know, there are places or where militias have taken up the fighting. But I, it has been a little bit shocking for me to see the ANDSF just melt away in some instances. And that is a reflection of a policy failure on the part of the United States and the fact that the Afghan government has not been able to rally its, its troops to defend its system of, of governance. So, that's been a little bit shocking. I did expect the Taliban to take provincial capitals. The fact it took so many in the Northeast was interesting. I think a lot of people expected them to concentrate on their heartland in the Southwest. But of course, interestingly, the fact that the Taliban focused on the Northeast, uh, you know, creates an ethnic component where if, if the Afghan government is to not try to take the, the, that territory back and just focuses on you know, Pashtun areas in, in, in Helmand and Kandahar, for example, that could stoke ethnic tensions within the Afghan government itself. So, you know, it, whether by design or, you know, by mistake, the Taliban have, have, have also risked stoking ethnic tensions in, in, by pursuing the North first and now pursuing the South. And, um, that being said, I think that the fact that they're gaining provincial capitals does not mean that there's not a point of diminishing returns. The Taliban just don't have enough people, enough men to hold all of this territory indefinitely. And there's going to come a point where they're stretched too thin. Um, and I still think there is an opportunity for the Afghan government to retake territory they have in some instances and, and to put up a better fight. I don't think it's lost yet. Uh, when I hear people make predictions that Kabul could fall in two weeks, you know, I, I take that with a real grain of salt. Um, but I would assume that in cases where military commanders surrender, I mean, uh, if they kind of join forces with the Taliban, then the Taliban have acquired new personnel, right? In other words, if the, if the military commanders say, Okay, we're no longer fighting you and we'll control this town. We'll keep controlling this town and we're no longer fighting you. Then haven't the Taliban in effect increased their manpower? Well, I don't think there's, I don't think that's what's driving it right now. I don't think they're just, you know, conscripting everyone they come across. I think a lot of it is just the ANDSF either running away, fleeing to a bordering countries or surrendering their weapons and, and, and leaving. Um, and not necessarily continuing to be a combatant. Um, now, in the future, it is going to be concerning if parts of, you know, certain figures in the Afghan government or the military defect to the Taliban. That's always a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, right now, the issue is that the Taliban have a very motivated, uh, you know, uh, group of fighters that, who have a lot of resolve to fight. And I think we have to remember some of the coverage of, of Afghanistan and the Afghan security forces talks about the Afghan soldiers as if they're hapless bystanders. They're not. They're supposed to fight. I mean, we need to remember this. Soldiers are supposed to fight. It's an absolute travesty 
when they abandon their post and run away. And it's and it's some kind of reflection, uh, you know. I would think on the degree of support the government has, and therefore on the viability of continued American involvement. On, on you know, I, I mean, it, it just seems like we've spent twenty years there, and it's not clear we built, helped build anything like a structure that in the long run was viable, right? I don't think we built a structure that in the long run is viable. I guess the question is going to be, this is a trial by fire for the Afghan government and will they stand up to the challenge and, and perhaps they will, and maybe they won't. Now you mentioned the uh, ethnic situation. Can you give us just a, a quick primer on that? So kind of the main ethnic groups and to what extent there is a correlation there between ethnicity and support for the government versus the Taliban, um, if there is one? Well, I let me say this with the disclaimer that I'm not an expert in the ethnography of Afghanistan. But, ba- you know, a 101 is that y- y- it's it's a diverse country with Uzbeks, Tajiks, Hazaras, um, in Pash, the center, Pashtuns, right? Pasht, yeah, Pashtuns. Uh, Pashtuns are they the, major- are they the majority the or the plurality, the Pashtuns? Um, I believe they're the plurality uh-huh. at this point. Um, and uh, I'd have to look at the, the data. For yeah, frankly. Uh, I think no, they're the pl- plurality or a slight majority. But um, the, you know, I, I think one mistake that happens is that the, the Pashtuns are, you know, spoken about as if they're synonymous with the Taliban. Now, the Taliban is historically a Pashtun dominated movement, but there are, they have managed to recruit from other ethnic groups. And of course there are Pashtuns who were part of the Northern Alliance in the past. And there were, you know, uh, that, that, that fought the Taliban. Um, and that was the, you know, original partner of, of the United States during its intervention in 2001. And there are Pashtuns who are of course part of the Afghan government, um, uh, Ashraf Ghani is a Pashtun. So, uh, they, you know, the, the idea that Pashtuns are synonymous with the Taliban, I think needs to be challenged. I just hear it a lot. Um, but there, is, there are ethnic tensions to, to the conflict. There's an ethnic component. And some of that is just because in, in a civil war, when you have atrocities commi- being committed by different sides, um, and they begin to be, you know, attached to a particular ethnic group, either accurately or inaccurately, that stokes ethnic identity. Um, and, and also, I think, you know, a violent form of ethnic identity. And I also think that when you don't have a strong national identity, at times, ethnic identity can come to the forefront. And do these different groups speak different languages? Uh, yeah, I mean the the, the primary language, the main two languages in uh, in Afghanistan is uh, Pashto and Dari, though. And Dari is is similar to uh, to Farsi. I mean, it's it's a so it's it's mutually intelligible, although it's different. Um, and uh, Pashto, of course, is, is the language of the Pashtuns. But there's many there's other many other languages spoken. But those are the main two languages. And I guess and have, you could say Dari is the lingua franca. And have government elites tended to come from a particular ethnic group, or has it been fairly diverse? I, I would say it's been fairly diverse. Uh huh. Okay, so um, you know, one just kind of tangential tactical question. You've kind of implicitly alluded to the fact that because of the weather in in Afghanistan, the fighting tends to get done in the summer. Uh, and, uh, I wondered, would it have made more sense? I mean, even if just from a crass political point of view for the Biden administration to, uh, both announce the withdrawal later and make it a little later, just like a couple of months so that as the American troops are withdrawing, the cold weather's coming and the Taliban aren't going to be able to make uh, such advances. Or is that, am I confused about the role of the weather there? Well, you're certainly right that summer is considered the fighting season and that in winter it becomes just logistically difficult to fight. And so, you know, depend, it was always considered a, a tougher deployment to go in the summer and a quieter deployment to go in the winter. Um, that's one of the more interesting questions I've been asked. 
I think you could, and I, I you know, I, I think I've heard it discussed before, but I haven't really thought about it myself. Um, and I guess my initial thoughts would be, you could make that case, but that would still just be a continuation of the last 20 years. Kicking the can down the road. Yeah. Kicking the can down the road. So you buy them, um, you know, maybe you buy them a few months uh, in summer and then winter to prepare and, and you leave in, and you leave in winter. Um, I think it's still kicking the can down Mm -hmm. the road. The counter argument in favor of, of it is I guess it would have allowed for more time to uh, transition and more time for the A and DSF to adjust. But I think had the Biden administration said just another six months at this point, it would have been interpreted by the Afghan government as, okay, we're just going to stick to the status quo like we always have, and he's not mm-hmm. really leaving. So I actually think they probably would have squandered the opportunity to um, prepare themselves. And then the big cost for the Biden administration is that, you know, he was already locked in to the May deadline when he assumed office. That was a date that the Trump administration chose. Mm -hmm. And if he had just blown past that date, which he already has, but if he had blown past that date and not shown a serious intention to withdraw, then I think the violence would have surged and been directed at us troops. And he would have had to justify that cost. And it might've been hard to say to the American people, Hey, I know we've just lost four soldiers, but, um, we're just trying to give the Afghan military yeah. a fighting chance in four months. Yeah. I mean, the reason I said maybe this is just uh, from a crass political point of view would make sense is because, yeah, I wouldn't expect uh, a, a, a later uh, withdrawal, a, a withdrawal put off by a few months to fundamentally change the long-term calculus. It's just that there wouldn't be this clear correlation between the U.S., leaving and all hell breaking loose, right? It would seem just as a political matter in America as if it had, it had uh, you know, the, the two events would be separated in time. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, I take your point that in the long run, uh, you know, we, we, we have kind of a deeper structural problem here that's going to have to be worked out. Now, now, do you think there is still some chance that the Taliban victory will just never be complete. And, and, and if so, I mean, what could that look like? I mean, it seems to me the worst way it could look is, is a, is an ongoing brutal civil war, such as we saw in Syria. Uh, and then I guess you can imagine a kind of a stalemate, uh, where different areas are controlled by different people. And maybe ultimately that's even solidified into some kind of, you know, permanent political arrangement. I don't know. What, what are you, how are you looking at the future scenarios right now? So if a political settlement isn't achieved, I don't think the Taliban will ever truly hold all of Afghanistan. I mean, even during their emirate in the late nineties, there were holdouts, uh, you know, f- uh, you know, fiefdoms and territories that the Northern Alliance held, such as in the Panjshir Valley, that the Taliban couldn't really reach. Um, but those are I not think, high population density areas. No, not not compared to to places like Kabul or Kandahar City. Um, so so, so I that, think. Okay, go I, go ahead. So, so in other words, the Taliban and that's an area the Taliban still could take all the big cities. It's it's certainly conceivable the Taliban could take all the big cities and that there'd be these pockets of resistance that the Taliban don't reach. But for the most part, the Taliban would control all the big cities. That's very conce- that's very conceivable. It's also conceivable that we reach a stalemate in a, a brutal civil war. The ANDSF gets its act together, but neither side is willing to negotiate. And so you see this sort of violent stalemate, very reminiscent of what we saw for the last 10 years, except probably more violent. Or you might see... Um, a political settlement achieved uh, if if the ANDSF put up a fight and the Taliban determined that, hey, we, you know, um, need to go back to the negotiating table or alternatively, maybe maybe the Taliban make significant gains, but they don't completely extinguish the government and the government decides to go for a political settlement that's very favorable to the Taliban, but is a political settlement nevertheless. So there's multiple scenarios we could see emerge in Afghanistan. And it's a bit of a fool's errand to even try to predict things. Uh-huh. Um, and if, 
But one scenario certainly is that the Taliban basically takes over the whole country, at least uh, major urban areas, most rural areas, and they are, whether we recognize them or not, the government of, of Afghanistan. That That's certainly now a, a, a real possibility. It's a possibility. And of course, one of the problems in achieving a political settlement is the moment when one side has the most leverage in negotiating is also, co- it also coincides with the moment when that side thinks it has the best chance right. of winning militarily. And so that's how these, you know, opportunities for peace deals slip away because people don't take advantage, you know, com- one side or the other doesn't take advantage of its high, its heightened leverage to go for a peace deal that will be favorable to it. And instead decides, you know what, we don't need a peace deal. We can just win this thing on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. But that turns out not to be true. I mean, just to look at a map of like what the Taliban controls, what they seem to have taken. uh, Although there could still be reversals, of course. Um, it, 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 the one scenario that doesn't seem all that, easy to imagine is some kind of clean regional division, you know, like, uh, well, I guess you'd say a two state solution of a certain kind. Right. I mean, it, it just seems, it looks geographically pretty messy. Is that, am I getting that right? It, if there were to be some sort of partition of Afghanistan. Yeah. Partition. Exactly. I, I mean, it doesn't look very geographically clean. Um, yeah. I mean, I think I, I I think the case, a case could be made for a decentralized government. Um, and actually, President Biden more or less endorsed that idea in one of his remarks. Um, I forget which one. But, you know, a case can also be made against a decentralized system. But I think a defensible case could be made for a decentralized government. But a partition, I don't think that would work very well. And I don't think that's the goal of, of the Afghan Taliban. I don't think they're, right. I don't think they would be content with their own fiefdom where they get to control things. I think they want it all. Now, if you imagine more or less complete takeover by the Taliban, except for a few, you know, pockets, uh, holdouts in, in, in not so densely populated areas, um, have you thought at all, or, or or do you know of people who have uh, thought about this? Um, like whether you can imagine a Taliban-run Afghanistan evolving into, you know, uh, not not what we might call a uh, our ideal state, but a state that isn't a isn't particularly menacing uh, from our point of view, and b and the point of view of neighbors, and b. Um, isn't uh just you know draconianly uh repressive and cruel uh, i mean those are two separate questions of course but i think a taliban led afghanistan would be quite draconian um of course there are other states in the world that are quite draconian that the united states does not you know invade and occupy i think we have to remember what the intention of this war was and separate that from the language we couched it with, which was mm-hmm. often rooted in human rights, but that was not the the fundamental driving force of this war. Um, if the United States deployed military forces in furtherance of human rights as the main motivator, then there'd be a lot of countries we'd be uh, mm-hmm. we'd be occupying. Um, and in fact, the U.S. military doesn't deploy troops to reduce violence either. We talk about violence reduction, but that's not how the U.S. troops are. There are many extremely violent conflicts. I mean, I think over 2,000, there were 2,000 uh, homicides in Mexico in the month of May, many of them from the narco war. That's an extremely violent conflict. Now, there are vast swaths of Mexico that don't feel that don't really feel the the grip of that conflict. But there are also vast swaths of Mexico that are essentially a war zone. And uh, we can go on with you know, Nigeria. There's parts of Nigeria that are essentially a war zone where brutal, brutal um, acts are being done, including to, to young girls. Um, we look at the DRC. So, you know, a, a conflict that has killed millions. So the fact that, you know, there's high rates of violence is not in and of itself doesn't drive U.S. military deployments. I say that as a preamble to say that, what the, the the type of government that emerges in Afghanistan 
you know, in a hypothetical Taliban led Afghanistan, I don't think will be a driving force in how, how the Biden administration reacts. I think the Taliban are going to face, you know, face a conundrum, which is that governance is difficult. And even their emirate wasn't very good at it. And I think they're not inheriting a population that is illiterate and that, you know, doesn't have cell phones and doesn't have access to the internet. It's going to be really hard to control Afghans when they have cell phones and Facebook. And, That's an interesting and Twitter point. This, and WhatsApp. This, this is a very different technological landscape than last time they were in charge. Exactly. And it's going to be much harder to control dissent, much harder to stop people from organizing, much harder to quell resistance and much harder to prevent the outside world from seeing the 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 uh, the horrors that they might commit. Um, so I think that's going to be a problem for the Taliban. Um, so I guess we'll have to see. I'm not hopeful that it's but, you know, and I guess the biggest concern for the United States is going to be terrorism. Right. Are the Taliban willing to deny groups? I mean, we know they're probably willing to fight ISIS um, because they have fought ISIS rel- rather consistently. But are they going to be willing to deny Al Qaeda, you know, operating capabilities? Uh, I, and, or, and do they, even if they are willing to do that, do they have the capability to deny Al Qaeda um, operating capabilities inside Afghanistan? I guess we'll have to wait and see. I do think the Biden administration gamed out the worst case scenarios where terrorism is still a threat or where a brutal Taliban regime uh, reemerges. And they decided at the end of the day that the cost of staying indefinitely, because that was the only other solution, indefinitely staying in Afghanistan, that cost was higher than the benefits or the risks of, of, of leaving. Mm-hmm. Or sorry, the, sorry, it was higher than the risks of leaving and, and also higher than the benefits of staying. Yeah, so what what is the relationship with Al-Qaeda? I mean, of course, this is the whole reason we invaded in the first place. They had provided a haven for Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda uh, attacked us on 9-11, and, um, and the rest is is history. But I gather even then, even, even around 9-11... Um, you know, it wasn't like Al Qaeda and the Taliban were the same. There was a there was a relationship between them. There were points of tension, but 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 the Taliban had decided to host them. What uh, what is the relationship like now, to the extent that you can you can sense it? Well, I mean, there's there's they they haven't divorced, so to speak. Uh, there's there have been Taliban, uh, sorry, Al Qaeda figures who have been killed and strikes uh, on the Taliban. Um, they are ideological cousins in many ways. So I think there's still a relationship there. Um, and the real question is going to come down to, do have the Taliban learned the lessons of 2001? And have they observed the lessons of Iraq where the United States was willing to go back to the country to fight ISIS? Mm-hmm. Um, the Taliban itself are an inward looking group. They really don't care that much about the rest of the world, which, by the way, reduces the leverage that the United States has in terms of aid and recognition, and, but also reduces the group's ambitions. They're not a transnational terrorist group. Mm-hmm. The Taliban really just want to control Afghanistan, and that's about it. And they're, I, I think they're content to do that. And um, I'm not sure that Mullah Omar really understood what he was getting himself into by not expelling um, Osama bin Laden and handing him over. Um, You know, I think that the Taliban of today understand international politics a little bit better. So we'll have to see. But either uh, in in a hypothetical situation where there's a Taliban led government, uh, they're going to have to decide whether they value being in power or whether they value hosting a few foreign fighters. I think after 9-11, we were actually demanding that uh, Omar do more than hand bin Laden over. And that may have been part of the problem. But if you look at the the ultimatum we gave them, it involved, you know, our going into Afghanistan in any event, I think, and 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 kind of uh, cleaning out the terrorist infrastructure or something. But um the uh, so and the other question is what I mean what kind of threat would Al Qaeda pose to us in any event? What are Al Qaeda's uh, ambitions these days? I don't have much of a sense for it because uh, 
they haven't seemed to involve us all that much, so far as I can tell, right? I mean, I we haven't been attacked by Al Qaeda. Do you, do you have a sense for like what Al Qaeda even is now? Well, Al Qaeda still exists, and Al Qaeda still has uh, the intention to attack the United States and pro- possibly the capability, but not the capability has been reduced, and Taliban and Al Qaeda has been degraded. Um, I think the question is, you know, if you look at things, if we were to look at things, you know, siphoned off from everything else and we just look at it in a vacuum. Yeah. Leaving Afghanistan makes the risk of a terrorist attack slightly higher because we're not generating human intelligence on the ground. We're not necessarily disrupting a plot. But we have to remember, you know, on September 10th, 2001, there was no homeland security. The NSA was not you know, monitoring everyone's phones. Um, the, 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 capa- the domestic capabilities were reduced. Now, Al Qaeda can go try to attack soft targets all around the world, consulates, hotels, kidnap U.S. citizens. It doesn't have to come to the American homeland to achieve its aims. That being said, I think for the Biden administration, it was just putting the risk in context with all the other risks that Americans face. And for the American people, I mean, look, we're, we're in a, a post-pandemic world, but we're very much still in the pandemic. Six, over 600,000 Americans have died. Um, the, I think this summer has demonstrated in tangible ways the reality of climate change for anyone who still has their doubts. Um, New York feels like the subtropics. And I know it has always been a hot, a hot city in the summer, but there's something different about this. Um, the idea that the United States should be focused on chasing a few Al Qaeda members in Afghanistan rather than dealing with the existential threats in front of it is absolutely preposterous to me. And I think the majority of Americans feel the same way. A few people who are exclusively focused on counterterrorism and whose job it is to focus solely on counterterrorism and a few folks in Washington, D.C. who have had blinders up to the rest of the country think we should stay in Afghanistan indefinitely because of terrorism. But everyone else disagrees. I mean, the other thing I'd say is that if you look at the... um kind of jihadist uh, terrorist attacks that have happened on the American mainland since 9-11, they have been so-called homegrown terrorism. And more often than not, the, the people who committed the terrorism would cite as their inspiration American involvement in wars in Islamic countries. I mean, they would specifically say, you're killing Muslims in Afghanistan, you're killing Muslims in in Iraq and so on, right? I, I mean, you would think there's an argument to be made that by pulling back uh, our military presence in some of these countries, we could be reducing the amount of so-called homegrown terrorism. Yeah, that's certainly possible. And I, I guess the lucky thing about homegrown terrorists is, is they tend to be in, incompetent. And maybe maybe the counterterrorism experts would argue, well, look, Al Qaeda, they're professionals. And when they pull off a plan, it works, unlike these homegrown folks. So we should, so as much as the homegrown folks might be radicalized and might be a threat, we should still focus on the professionals. I'm trying to play devil's advocate Mm -hmm. here. I don't think that's a valid argument. I think it is true that these wars have radicalized uh, groups of people. And I I, I think we've had a myopic focus on these terrorist groups. And I think their ability to reach uh, the the homeland exists, but it's degraded. And I think we have other tools other than perpetual occupation of a foreign country to deal with it. Um, and we have to have other tools than that to deal with it, or we should be occupying a lot more countries to deal with a potential terrorist threat. Um, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And I think the concern of the Biden administration is that if a terrorist attack were to occur on American soil, even if it only killed 10 people, the domestic political cost of that in a post-withdrawal environment would be extremely high because we have a bunch of opportunistic politicians who wouldn't let go of it. Um, But we need to decide as a country, what is our destiny going to be? Are we going to ignore existential threats, um, one of which has already killed 600,000 people and the other of which threatens uh, the the very um, continuation of Earth? Or are we going to be a country that cannot figure out how to extract itself from a 20-year 
uh, war in an important but relatively remote Central Asian country. Okay. I want to uh, ask you about one, just one final um, thing, which is the uh, the regional context. I, I think, uh, you know, Americans kind of naturally think about Afghanistan and its relation, sh- and its relation to American interests. But uh, from the point of view of Afghans, we're far from the only major power that matters. I mean, there's Pakistan, there's India, uh, there's also, uh, there's Russia, there's China, there's Iran. Um, what are some of the, well, the major forces uh, impinging on the situation there from around its borders? And, and then eventually I want to, I, I want to get a sense for whether some of those powers could play even a constructive role in stabilizing Afghanistan. But for starters, why don't you just give us a little, a sense for how much the future of Afghanistan matters to some of the powers around there uh, and, and, and why they will continue to have a stake in it. Well, Afghanistan matters to Pakistan for two primary reasons. One, it sees an Af- a strong Afghanistan that's close with India and the Afghan government is close with India as a threat. It's quite paranoid about proxy war and in India using Afghan soil um, and, and it, you know, I think the second big thing is it has a lot of anxiety over the Durand line. Some nationalists in Afghanistan and some Pashtun nationalists think that the Durand line that divides, um, Afghanistan from Pakistan is not a legitimate border. And in fact, Afghanistan should be much larger. Um, and I think, you know, especially due to, um, Pakistan's history and losing East Pakistan, which became Bangladesh they have a certain paranoia about uh, irredentist movements or the idea that they might lose territory. And that has caused them to support the Taliban uh, quite consistently. Iran has also supported the Taliban, um, but mostly as a way of, of poking at the United States. And much of that support, you know, the support really went into overdrive after 2012, just as a way of poking at the United States. The, tall, the, the Iranians worked with um, the uh, United States in the early part of the war. In fact, they provided intelligence. Um, uh, Zarif, who was then in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but you know, uh, later we know became the Foreign Minister of Iran, uh, was a very important player in the Bonn Conference that helped, and, and he really helped facilitate agreement between different Afghan factions to you know, create an interim government. So Iran actually played a crucial role in the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan. I mean, it was supportive, but of course, the Bush administration labeled it part of the axis of evil, and that support receded, even as Iran continued to support the Afghan government. But where we really see Iran stepping up its support for the Taliban is in 2012. Um, China, you know, was always sort of involved, but happy to see the Americans in a quagmire, I think, and, and probably the same for Russia. Um I mean, and, China and, yeah. has concerns about the Turk, the Turkic uh, Muslims on its uh, western, in its western area, right? And, and 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 some kind of synergy, possible synergy between their any secessionist aspirations they may have, and 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 people in Afghanistan. Is that right? Well, yeah, China is China is extremely paranoid about. Um, the prospect of, of Uyghur terrorism. And I, I have to, you know, I think provide this caveat, which is that I, China's, you know, China's para, I think it's best described as paranoia. Maybe there's some security threat, but I think it's best described as paranoia. And to the extent that China has, you know, justified its human rights violations of the Uyghurs on security, it's absolutely appalling. That being said, we're talking about the perspectives of these regional actors. And from China's perspective, there is a potential for, you know, Uyghur terrorist groups to use Afghanistan soil. And this gets to a bigger point, which is all of these countries, China, Pakistan, Iran, wanted the United States to withdraw. But now that the hypothetical is becoming a reality, I think they're having a bit of buyer's remorse. And hmm. Um, Pakistan is realizing that its own, you know, the Pakistani Taliban, as they're sometimes called, or the TTP, uh, the Tariq Taliban Pakistan, um, which are sometimes interchangeably 
called the Pakistani Taliban, although it's, it's slightly different. But, um, you know, they've been emboldened by the victory or what they perceive to be the victory of the Afghan Taliban in Afghanistan. And we're seeing we're seeing TTP attacks in Pakistan skyrocket. We see China is concerned about security now. Iran is now going to have, you know, the Taliban on its border. So I think these countries said they wanted the U.S. to leave. But in reality, they had been really comfortable with slow Taliban gains and the U.S. just being there to keep everything at a simmer. They had been really, they had become really comfortable with that status quo. And now they're faced with the reality that they're going to have to be responsible for Afghanistan because it's in their backyard. And I think it's a wake-up call for the, these countries. And I guess it's very hard to imagine how this might play out or how you know, ideally, it might even have a kind of benign effect. In other words, uh, these these powers might decide it was it was in their interest to steer things toward stability and ideally even um, a a humane kind of stability. I I guess one constructive thing would be if India and Pakistan could ever um, reduce tensions between them. Right. I, I mean, I mean, I mean, Afghanistan is, uh, they see it as a battleground between them, right? A, a kind of proxy battleground. Yeah, to a large extent. I think, look, if, if tensions could be reduced between India and Pakistan and, and look, some of the tensions along the line of control, which is, you know, the disputed border have been reduced. But if tensions were to really be reduced, yeah, that would have a, that would have a very positive impact on the entire region. I don't see that happening anytime soon. There's a potential for the, for there to be a a positive effect of these regional powers realizing that if Afghanistan descends into chaos, it's going to be their problem. But in I terms of, seen, you mean in terms of refugees and, and in terms of refugees, in terms of terrorism, in terms of trade, in terms of chaos. I mean, in, in terms of all of that, mm-hmm. I don't. But I don't see them stepping up in a real way. I see more of a wait and see approach to see who they think the winner is going to be. I don't see them yet stepping up to lead regional negotiations. They mm-hmm. need to lead regional negotiations, and the United States needs to robustly support those negotiations, but also be willing to step back and let it be region led. Um, but that's not going to happen in the next few months because the Taliban are in no mood to negotiate. They think they're winning. So what's really necessary, which I think I mentioned before, is that the, the Afghan security forces really have to hold their ground through summer and fall and get to that winter season where the fighting goes down and and show the Taliban that they're not just going to be able to bulldoze their way to power. You got to come back to the negotiating table. And if so, if the fighting has to happen first, unfortunately. And if that happens, then a region regional led negotiation process could make a difference. Mm-hmm. OK, well, I guess we can uh, we can hope we can hope for that, uh, you know, for some some sort of stabilizing influence uh, emanating from from beyond Afghanistan's borders. Um, But I assume one possibility, sadly, is a sustained uh, kind of brutal civil war, uh, maybe even approaching the magnitude of Syria's. I don't know. Does that that seem like a possibility? I mean, it could be far worse than Syria's. I think a brutal civil war is certainly possible. Yes. Okay. Well, let's hope it doesn't happen. Um, thanks so much, Adam. Where can people find your stuff? Like what, what's your Twitter handle or anything else you're? My Twitter handle is uh, at Adam Noah, who A-D-A-M-N-O-A-H-W-H-O. So at Adam Noah, who. Um, and if you go to the Quincy Institute's um, website, you can find a, re- a long form report of about 25 pages I wrote on Afghanistan from April. But I think many of it talks a lot about negotiations and the, yeah, I think a lot of it is still relevant today. Um, and, and you can find my writing if you just uh, search my name, Adam Weinstein in Afghanistan, Adam Weinstein in Pakistan. There is another Adam Weinstein who is a journalist. Sometimes we get confused with each other. But for the most part, if it's about Afghanistan and Pakistan, I wrote it. Um, you he didn't. My... Let's make that clear. Let's not give him any credit. <laughs> well, I do admire his writing, but yeah, I'll, I'll take most of the credit for the Afghanistan and Pakistan uh, publications, although he has written some things. 
Um, yeah, so uh, look out for it. And uh, there, there's uh, a lot of other great scholarship. And I, I always say to also, you know, pay attention to what Afghans are saying as well. Um, so uh, I appreciate your time having me on today. Well, it's very illuminating. Thanks. Um, and thanks to everybody for listening and or watching. Uh, if you like uh, The Right Show, uh, please do take a minute to uh, rate and review. Um, and uh, Adam, as, as things evolve, maybe maybe we'll talk to you down the road. Thanks a lot for taking the time. Thank you.